Welcome to the Healthcare Executive Podcast, providing you with insightful commentary and developments in the world of healthcare leadership. To learn more, visit ACHE.org. And without further ado, your host. Hello, everyone, and welcome to ACHE's Healthcare Executive Podcast. This is Eric Sperling, your host for today. So pleased to welcome our guest today, Jay Manuel Ocasio, the Chief Human Resources Officer for Luminous Health, headquartered in Annapolis, Maryland. He serves as the executive leader overseeing strategic and operational HR plans for more than 9,000 medical staff, employees, and volunteers across the health system. Now, prior to Luminous Health, Manny served as the Chief Human Resources and Compliance Officer for Asbury Communities Incorporated. That is a multi-state senior care services company and the Chief Human Resources and Integrity Officer at Holy Cross Health in Maryland. Now, Manny is a strategy and innovation PhD candidate at the International School of Management. He has a Juris Doctor degree from University of Maryland School of Law and his MBA from Johns Hopkins University Cary Business School. Manny is also a senior certified professional with the Society for Human Resource Management and of course, board certified in healthcare management right here at the American College of Healthcare Executives. Manny, welcome into the Healthcare Executive Podcast. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me over. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Great conversation uh, coming our way. First off, congratulations to you and your staff on reaching a major milestone last month. I have this correct. You've delivered more than 100,000 vaccines to the communities you serve? 101,000 by now, but yes. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, just tell us what else is going on for you and your team at Luminous Health right now. So, you know, I, I'd always start by by saying that our biggest asset has been to have a workforce where there's a broad and deep commitment to our values of respect, inclusion, service, and excellence, which are the values um, that we subscribe to at Luminous Health. And to be quite frank, in the last three months that I've been here, I just started at Luminous Health. Um, virtually everyone that I've had the opportunity to talk to um, feels connected to the fulfillment of our mission to enhance the health of the people and the communities we serve. So that, that, that is sort of the, the, the great part about uh, working in healthcare these days, particularly when people are connected, that you actually notice it when you walk around and you do the rounds. So not only have we administered 100,000 vaccines a little bit over since they became available earlier this year, but we have also been advancing as a health system, a really ambitious agenda for integration of all of our entities. As you probably know, um, or can find out, uh, Luminous Health just uh, recently, actually just right before the pandemic, affiliated uh, Doctors Community Medical Center in Prince George's County in Maryland. And through the pandemic, we worked at integrating our benefit structures, provide better value per dollar spent to our staff, to a very thoughtfully integrated health benefit plan that attempts to leverage the exceptional physicians that we have affiliated with Luminous Health and the great value that we provide as the high quality, low cost uh, provider of services in our area. So in the acute care space. So I think it's a great combination. And we were able to do that through the pandemic. Uh, the staff are really excited now that that process is almost over. And, uh, and I think it's a great value to both the organization and to the staff. Well, uh, congratulations and great work. And speaking of staffing, let's talk about staffing and discuss a few trends in healthcare right now. So even before the pandemic, uh, healthcare was facing, we know, staffing shortages in some key areas. Everyone saw the headlines around nursing and primary care. Um, but what about lab technicians, home healthcare workers, others? What trends are you seeing at Luminous and uh, at your peer institutions and how are you guys working to close those gaps? Well, the one thing there's no shortage of is challenges. <laughs> so um, you, you kind of have to approach it with a, the right measure of analysis and optimism. At Luminous Health, as I was at my prior organization, I think we had a healthy dose of optimism about what the world would look like post pandemic. You cannot understate it, but we also analyzed and have been analyzing uh, the market for virtually every job just to make sure that we remain competitive and that we can make a little bit of a dent in the enormous trend and, and the costly trend of having significant expenses in contract labor, which have 
been the, the rule of the day in healthcare since the beginning of the pandemic. We know that the market won't be the same at the end of the, of the pandemic. You know, the pandemic has a tail. 25% of women exited the workforce during the pandemic. In organizations such as ours, in my last organization, women were about 75% of the population. In this one, it's about 82 to 86%, depending on, on, which, on which month you're measuring. And in the case of nursing, it is 95% of the population at Luminous Health. So that gives you a sense of the, um, of the difficulties when you have such a large number of women exit the workforce, the impact on healthcare institutions is disproportionate. And because of that, we've, we've seen a significant increase in, in the cost of labor, and we're working towards making that more equitable and investing in our staff first rather than rather than investing in contract labor first. And we are doing that across the organization in every job, uh, looking to make sure that we can, in fact, turn the tide a little bit. That's not just a function of uh, compensation, however. There is a, a, a significant emphasis in the organization towards appreciation. And appreciation also comes with, with monetary benefits. Uh, but we want to make sure that we are a provider of, of services that also is a good steward of the workforce that, that we have. And, and I'm confident and um, comfortable that we will continue to be a, a, an employer of choice in our area as we have been, and that we will um, weather this well. We have people who have been with us through the pandemic. We are rewarding them. In fact, by the time this podcast comes about, in fact, uh, tomorrow, they'll be receiving a well-deserved appreciation bonus that, that we have made um, uh, possible uh, for all of our workforce uh, who are not in management. Everybody will receive uh, a $1,000 uh, additional pay in their paycheck for those who are full-time, will be prorated for those who are part-time and and don't work quite as much, but it's a gesture um, of appreciation, uh, and we hope it it gets us the goodwill that we know we have from the workforce, and that it just enhances it a little bit. Plus, an additional commitment of five hundred dollars by the end of the year to those who stay with us. So you can't pay enough for what people have done in light of the pandemic uh, to serve the communities and the patients that have come through our doors. But we think we can share a little bit on the good fortune of the organization uh, to make sure that we, we appreciate the people that have done it. And uh, we're very proud that we're able to do that. Love hearing that, Manny. And that optimism and that appreciation uh, may help to answer this, this next question, because this was a concern that predated the pandemic, you know, burnout in the healthcare workforce. Uh, like so many other issues, COVID-19 just accelerated burnout. Uh, but we also saw a swift reactions and very creative solutions to provide employees with mental health support. So are there any uh, mental and behavioral health programs that Luminous has put in place during the pandemic that you're keeping or building on now? And then you know, there's other ways, you just mentioned a few that you would recommend to other hospital leaders to help in this area when it comes to uh, burnout in the healthcare workforce. You know, it's, it's actually opportune that you ask that question. I know how much we all love uh, Friday afternoon meetings with our peers and uh, <laughs> the types of conversations that happen at 3 or 4 p.m. on a Friday when everybody really wants to go. But I have to say, I had one of the best debriefs just last week um, on a Friday afternoon, and I wouldn't change it for anything. It was actually a debrief on something that Luminous did during the pandemic called support rounds. And it basically included a number of leaders in the organization who committed to actually put up, you know, tilt their hat a bit from leader to servant, right? To, to really exemplify servant leadership in its most complete and comprehensive way. And quite courageously, rather than, than sit in a place and, um, and try to sort of solve problems from a distance, rounded and rounded and rounded with staff and listened to staff, validated their concerns in a very safe way, meaning provided them safety to say whatever it is that was in their minds, emotionally, 
from a materials perspective, from a barriers perspective to being able to do their jobs, to just exactly how they feel uh, or they felt in terms of the helplessness that a pandemic tends to bring to healthcare workers. And I was impressed with how much that meant to the staff, how much it meant to the, to the leaders who actually engaged in it, and how much it just promoted goodwill throughout the organization. And that's just one of the things that we did that I think have been extraordinary. And we are now making it, or at least attempting, in fact, um, sort of creating the programmatic reality so that we can actually continue to do that, not, not just during the pandemic, but as the pandemic begins to end, and as we hope it ends, and expand it to every part of the organization that wants to do it and that feels that it's the right thing for their for their staff and for their leaders. Let's go a little deeper into that, into uh, the healthcare management field, since of course that is ACHE specialty. Uh, what skills and attributes you think most help a leader succeed at Luminous Health? I mean, you just you just mentioned servant leadership, but what are some of those other skill sets that you think make a leader succeed? And then on 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 the heels of that, you know. Has your ideal candidate changed at all since the beginning of the pandemic as we work through this here? You know, Eric, that's a great question in many ways. And at the beginning, I used to think, oh, my God, at the end of this process that a pandemic creates, you know, by, by, or, or the course of the pandemic, we will never be the same. And yet, interestingly enough, particularly in this organization, and I find that quite revealing, the organization had had undertook a, you know, the development of a framework for leadership that we affectionately call TCB, and it's based on team change and business, and it is the and and it's the set of both values and behaviors that leaders in the organization need to exhibit in order for the organization to be in. in in order for the organization and the leader, him or herself, to be successful. I'd say that that framework rings truer today. The ability to operate in a team despite the, um, the challenges of communication during the pandemic. The ability to embrace change that comes rather rapidly and sometimes not all digested. If you think about how the regulators were throwing regulator, regulations at us during the pandemic and actually continue to do so. And, and not, to, not to any fault of theirs, but because it's, it's just the nature of the beast. And at the same time, keep an eye on the businesses. Um, in fact, the, the businesses that we are, the complicated organizations that actually deliver, deliver healthcare and make sure that we steer them the right way, that we ensure their long-term sustainability despite the rapid change. I think those things continue to ring true and the strengthening of that framework, you know, cemented on our values of respect, inclusion, service, and excellence will continue to be the recipe for success for every leader in the organization. Yeah, you talked a little bit about, you know, some of the things you're focused on for retention. So um, do you find that healthcare managers are looking for different options from their workplace now that we're post, not really yet, but post pandemic, um, such as you mentioned, you know, increased benefits or more flexible work arrangements. Are you seeing that? Yeah, I think that that's true um, for, for every industry, you know, and at Luminous, we have convened a multidisciplinary team that's looking into the future of work. We're actually being proactive into sort of saying, okay, what does it look like? One, not just now, but when it's over. And I'm lucky to have um, Saad Chowdhury, our chief information officer as a partner in the development of, of an enterprise-wide approach that recognizes that the workplace post-pandemic will be quite a different place. Uh, it won't be the same as it was. And it, it, it is in fact a, a time to co-create a new reality. We are drawing from multiple disciplines and experiences within our organization, as well as in, as in healthcare in general and the general industry, to come up with what will be our right approach. And again, not to mention them too many times, but it has to be cemented on our values. 
we want to make sure that whatever approach we take, and it is pretty evident that for many people in non-direct caregiver positions, it will be hybrid, is the right answer for us based on that uh, team change business framework and also based on the respect, inclusion, service and excellence values that we've articulated. We know that it's gonna be based on job design, that it has to count on the connection or, or it has to foster and enhance the connection between what you do and who you do it for. And that is the guiding principle that I think will lead us into what's the right level of flexibility, what's the high, right level of hybridity, and to what extent some people don't actually need to come into a workplace at all and do their jobs from somewhere else. At the same time, we wanna make sure that nobody feels abandoned, right? That when you need people to provide you support because you're in the front lines, you feel the support, you see the support, um, and that you can access it. Uh, and that can come in many ways. And we're also looking at how to engage people who are just about to exit the workforce and seek retirement in, in ways that continue to keep them in front of patients, but perhaps at a distance. You know, every nurse has, you know, the nurses in, in Maryland in particular are on average 49 to 50 years old. Many of them are extraordinarily competent and, and don't necessarily want to have the physical demands that, that the nursing profession requires into your 60s or your 70s if you're still working at the bedside. But they can be extraordinary in assessing the status of a patient who's actually changing from level of care to other levels of care, something that we do constantly in the context of acute care. And we're hoping that by incorporating technology into those processes, we can also allow for more flexibility from that side of the workforce over time to do these things perhaps remotely or, or perhaps in a much more conducive environment that's perhaps centralized where you can actually sit down and actually effectuate these tasks for the support of the people who are in fact in the front line so that they can focus on direct care and, and other tasks that have to be done in person. Yeah. And I just want to echo again what you said, um, because it was profound when it came, you know, being proactive about it, time to co-create a new reality. And you're absolutely right. It goes beyond healthcare. Um, I want to talk for a moment about inclusion. We're increasingly hearing about the critical need for very effective diversity, equity, and inclusion practices in healthcare, and again, going beyond healthcare. But the data shows that patient outcomes and financial bottom lines improve when DEI practices improve, uh, especially when executives, C-suites, and boardrooms look more like the communities they serve. So does Luminous, Luminous Health have programs and practices in place to both hire and develop diverse employees? Well, I have to say in this I am just so proud to work for an organization that you know, has proudly proclaimed that it is an anti-racist organization at a time in which you know, it's so much easier um, to sort of be neutral or, or perhaps a bit um, more cautious about your pronouncements. Last year, as the pandemic raged on, Luminous Health had a very active task force called the Heart Task Force that was in fact sort of examining the effects of racism, um, the effects of inequity in, in all aspects of the provision of care and on our workforce. And their deliverable at the end of this past year was a set of recommendations that are as bold as the task force was and they want us and they've endorsed, and so has our board who took their report to heart. They've endorsed to lead as an anti-racist organization and gave us the charge to confront racism and eradicate inequities in care. They also want us to enhance and continue to enhance our culturally informed communication and community collaboration. And ultimately, they want us to measure and integrate accountability into every single one of our diversity, equity, and inclusion measures. We had had, we had 
extraordinary success in one of our measures that we have put as, as a true north, one of the things that we followed most closely at Luminous Health. And it was to ensure that there had been a diverse candidate present in every search in the final slate uh, for every search that we did for senior leaders. And we actually were so successful that we have not stopped tracking it, but we actually moved it away from our true north measure to say we were that good. Uh, and I'm actually a, a, um, a product of that process. And, um, and I think that it is an unbelievable asset to continue that work that the task force did next uh, through next year and to get through those 10 steps that they said we needed to actually accomplish in the course of the next year to actually get to the next level. So I'm, I'm proud of being here. I'm proud of, of the work of that, uh, of the task force. I, I got to participate in one of their meetings towards the end as they were coming up with these recommendations. I was surprised at their boldness and I was pleasantly surprised at, at how much support we got from every segment of the organization, from our courageous CEO, from our unbelievable chief diversity, equity and inclusion officer, and from everyone on that board. Um, it, was, it was just a labor of love and it showed. Well, congrats on that, Manny. It's great for other healthcare leaders to hear that because it is all about repeating a positive. So congrats to you in that area. Finally, uh, we like to close with this question. Whenever we have a fellow of ACHE on the show, would you please tell us how the organization and your FACHE credential has helped you in your own career journey? So I'll say two things, and it's, it's, this is true for every, organ, every healthcare organization I've worked at since the beginning of my career in healthcare. I have had the pleasure and the privilege to be able to look up to extraordinary leaders to whom I've had the, the privilege of reporting to and who have had my well-being and my career interests at, at hand, I mean, at, in mind. Every single time I've changed jobs and, um, and I've had the, the, the opportunities that have been afforded to me, I, I've never had to worry too much about my career because somebody else is worried about it and somebody else is trying to develop me and somebody is invent, investing on it. On, on it. And that's, that's something that I don't think everyone can say. But in healthcare, I have found it. Uh, at Luminous in particular, it's been just a lovely process of being included into this extraordinarily well thought of organization with enormous accomplishments. I'll say that what, what the FACHE credential has given me is a rounded view of what healthcare organizations look like and how they function. It allows me to be competent in in a body of knowledge, in, in elements of a body of knowledge that allow me to ask the right questions. I may not know the answers. There's in fact an enormous amount of people who are much smarter than I am who do have the answers. I, I pride myself in being able to ask questions that come from having studied that body of knowledge and, be, and, and become competent in it. And, and I think that's, that's the value of the credential, that's the value of the process. And that's the value that ACHE brings uh, to people who pursue certification uh, from the Board of Governors. Manny, thank you so much. Uh, what a great guest uh, you've been today. What a great conversation we had. Thank you, Eric. It's been my pleasure. And uh, best of luck with all those great initiatives and the projects you've shared with us today. I want to thank all of our listeners for joining us today. We'll, of course, see you next time on the Healthcare Executive Podcast. Please don't forget to check out the latest issue of the magazine and more podcast episodes available at healthcareexecutive.org. This has been the Healthcare Executive Podcast, brought to you by the American College of Healthcare Executives. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider rating and reviewing on iTunes or your podcasting app of choice. And for more information, find us online at ache.org.